What is it about the ocean that is so terrifying? Perhaps it's the truth about what's really living in the ocean. But why is so much of it hidden away from public view? Is there truly a conspiracy to cover up the washed up experiments and mysterious sea creatures that float ashore? January 10th, 2008. It was a lovely summer day in the Southern Hemisphere. Daniel Cupido and a group of his friends and relatives decided to spend their day together in the Searbrock, South Africa. Their plan was to picnic and grill along the banks of the Buffalo Yogs River. As they relaxed together, Daniel noticed a curious sound emanating from the water. In his words, it was like someone bashing on a wall. Looking in the direction of the noise, Daniel saw a figure thrashing violently in the river by a low bridge. It appeared to be a woman with long black hair. Daniel immediately sprung into action, ready to save a drowning victim. And within moments of wading into the water, however, he stopped dead in his tracks. Something was wrong. Through splashes, he caught a glimpse of the woman's eyes and they shone a bright red. Daniel said that shivers went down his very spine. He had no desire to go any further, but felt himself compelled closer, almost as if hypnotized. Now, frantic, he calls for his son and nephew, and when they appeared by his side, their presence broke the trance. Now free, Daniel called the attention of everyone on shore to the woman in the water, among them was Martin Olkers, who later told reporters that he saw the woman swim underneath the bridge before climbing it and diving back into the black water below. She never resurfaced. The entire time, Martin said that she howled like a woman crying the strangest sound he had ever heard. Martin's mother, Dina, agreed saying that the profound sorrow in her voice made her feel that her heart could take it no more. Immediately, the group began discussing what they had witnessed. All agreed that it was a creature their parents had warned them about, a dreadful half-human, half-fish creature known for living in South Africa's deep pools. The creatures were known for drowning hapless bystanders. It was the Cayman a mermaid. Races of aquatic beings are a truly universal motif, found in every mythology across the world where they go by countless names. Sirens, Merfolk, Hafru, Rosalcas, Selkies, Sinjike, Nino, and the Dee People. Some are deities while others are shapeshifters, fairies, or the souls of the drowned dead. Some inhabit the seas and oceans, while others frequent inland waterways like ponds, lakes, and rivers. Despite this variety, we can roughly generalize merfolk attributes. They can be male or female. Many combine the human form with anatomy from aquatic mammals or fishes, including scales and fins. Some depictions of merfolk mix and match these features. Often, their top half will be human, while the bottom half is a fish-mammal hybrid. The fish tails are oriented vertically, while the tails of aquatic mammals and mermaids are horizontal. In many instances, merfolk are not restricted to the water, but can actually trade their fins for feet, though their toes might be webbed. For example, the Scottish Selkies simply shed their seal skins when they wish to come ashore. Contrary to their depiction and popular culture, most mermaids and mermen are incredibly dangerous in folklore. Many love to drag people to their doom, either to drown them or keep them as underwater lovers. To accomplish this, some merfolk utilize miraculous powers of enticement in the form of hypnotism, sorcery, or otherworldly singing. The mermaid's song figures in some of the earliest Western accounts pulled from ancient Greek mythology. The sirens, from which we get the English word for emergency alarms, would beckon to lonely sailors with their beautiful song. While the original sirens were depicted as human-headed birds by the classical period, their form had shifted to the human-fish hybrid we all know today. 
But this combination even existed before the sirens, when mermaids appeared as various gods and goddesses. The oldest is perhaps a Targatis, chief goddess of Syria, worshipped at least as early as 1000 BC. In her tale, she dove into a lake to become a fish, but the other deities would not allow her to discard her beauty, so she only took this form below her waist. While old, belief in a Targatis may be recent compared to New World and African religions. Numerous merfolk appear throughout the cultures of these continents, some with origins so ancient we may never know when they began. For example, there is evidence suggesting that a Native American mermaid cult might have thrived along the Pascagoula River in the southern United States. One of the more tantalizing stories out of Africa can be found in Dogen belief. The religion that these Malian people surrounds the entirety of the Nomo twins, a pair of aquatic beings. They are sometimes depicted as serpents or fishes from the waist down, humans with green skin and hair from the waist up. Now, according to the Dogan, the Nomo came from the stars, going as far as to pinpoint their planet of origin, a world circling the star Sirius. To support this possibility, tantalizing evidence suggests that the Dogan were able to discern aspects of Sirius long before Western astronomers, aspects unobservable to the naked eye. Returning to Earth, the earliest scientific explanations for merfolk held that most sightings actually represented misidentified sea creatures, usually pinnipeds, animals like seals and walruses or sirenians, commonly called dugongs or manatees. This explanation is quite likely in some cases. A Capuchin monk visiting the Congo in 1632 claimed to have eaten a mermaid, as did a group of sailors in 1739. Both loved the taste. Comparing it to veal, I guess chicken of the sea is a little too obvious. The idea that either would have dined on something resembling a person is unbelievable, but eating a seal or manatee is conceivable. In other stories, the possibility of misidentification becomes harder to swallow. Pardon the pun. Accounts from Christopher Columbus's journey to the New World in 1492 describe at least three mermaids seen leaping a good height out of the sea. They're not so fair as they are painted, they said. A prevailing wisdom holds that drunken sailors misidentified marine mammals as mermaids in their lonely desperation. You may have been drunk, you may have been really horny, but how drunk and horny do you have to be to mistake a manatee for a mermaid? I mean, come on. Instead of many historical reports of merfolk should be taken on face value as the anomalies they are, especially when reported by credible observers or seafaring populations familiar with maritime wildlife, we have plenty of examples. We find some of the earliest historical merfolk sightings in the writing of Pliny the Elder. Now, according to the first century naturalist, sightings were once commonplace. He had even learned of coastal residents who heard one dying, causing a piteous moan, crying and shattering very heavily. According to Pliny, correspondence between Roman Emperor Augustus and the governor of Gaul, a region around modern France and Germany, described mermaids beached on shore. Many were seen cast upon the sands and lying dead. The intervening centuries contain a sporadic mixture of fact and legend. Ireland saw tales including a mermaid caught in a fisherman's net in 558, a nearly 200-foot-long mermaid, likely a beached whale, in 887, and two mermaids caught near Waterford in 1118. Merfolk were allegedly apprehended in Suffolk in 1197 and the Netherlands in 1403. The latter supposedly lived ashore among humans for 15 years before perishing. Merfolk sightings resurfaced more frequently during the 1600s, and many reported by historical figures. Famous New World explorer Henry Hudson recorded that on June 15, 1610, he saw a mermaid of the classic description, 
complete with a lily white top half, human breasts, long dark hair, and a porpoise's tail. Hudson Bay and the Hudson Strait would later take their name from this legacy. In 1614, another credible observer, Captain John Smith, whose life would later intersect with Pocahontas, also saw a mermaid while exploring the West Indies. He said that she possessed large eyes, rather too round, finely shaped nose, and well-formed ears, rather too long and her hair long green, imparted an original character by no means unattractive. Smith claimed to feel the first pains of love before she dove underwater, revealing her fishy bottom half. Come on, John, keep it in your pants. That same century, a seaman in Maine's Casco Bay claimed his vessel was boarded by a mermaid. The witness, a Mr. Mitter, claimed to have lopped off one of its arms, leaving the body to sink to the depths while a purplish sheen of blood billowed to the surface. Sightings would continue into the 18th century. Supposedly, Belief in merfolk was so strong that the infamous pirate Blackbeard instructed his crew to avoid certain enchanted waters said to be infested with the beings. In 1723, Danish authorities sought to squash rumors of mermaids until they themselves spotted a merman with deep-set eyes who bellowed at them off the coast of Faroe Islands. Hundreds of witnesses spotted merfolk all around Bergen, Norway, in the mid-1700s. Sometime prior to 1791, Henry Reynolds spotted a 16-year-old girl in the surf off of the Welsh coast. The girl's bottom half resembled that of an eel, constantly tracing circular patterns as it propelled her human half through the water. The mermaid's arms seemed thick and short, her hair streaming in brown ribbons across her forehead and back. The sighting lasted around an hour, with the creature getting as close as 35 feet. Merfolk appeared to Scottish witnesses with alarming regularity in the 19th century, and on January 12, 1809, a pair of women at a sandside beach saw a plump pink female face pop up offshore. She brushed her green hair out of her face with a pale arm before returning to the depths. Three years later, on October 13th, John McClazick of Kintyre saw a mermaid on a rocky outcrop. Her scaly tail was a brindled gray red, her upper half white with long, light brown hair. The face was human, but the eyes almost appeared hollow. She sunned, groomed, and stretched herself for two hours before plopping into the sea. Not only did prominent community members attest to John's character, but another witness stepped forward with a similar description from that same day. Sightings continued around Scotland throughout the century, including a dramatic series of accounts in 1814. Too many to list here, in fact. We often blame older sightings on superstition and misidentification. But what about sightings from the modern era? Are contemporary witnesses mistaken as well? The early 20th century saw merfolk stories surfacing, no pun intended, all over the world. In 1900, Scotsman Alexander Gunn spotted one in a watery gully in the highlands while rescuing a lost sheep. The human-sized creature sported locks of red, curly hair, and bluish-green eyes. Its back was arched like a cat, imparting a sense of fear and aggression. Around 1921, a fisherman claimed to see a fish-tailed woman around South Africa's Das Inn Island. Fourteen years later, a fishing boat three miles off Redondo Beach in California spotted a bearded merman with dark hair and shining eyes. The creature was large, 10 to 12 feet long, and flapped its tail as it dove under the water. The fisherman gave chase, but lost the elusive beast. The following year in 1936, a Scandinavian sailor off the coast of Chile saw a green-haired mermaid who sang to him in a plaintive wail. One of the most compelling merfolk sightings of the modern era comes to us from World War II. In 1943, Japanese soldiers stationed on Indonesia's Kai Islands began seeing strange shapes in the surf. They looked like humans but had pink skin, mouths like carps, 
and rows of spines atop their heads. Unlike traditional mermaids, the creatures lacked tails and instead bore a pair of legs. These bizarre beasts regularly played in the lagoons at night, where they were often mistaken for children until illuminated by flashlights. Whenever they were confronted, they invariably retreated back into the water, swimming away with a breaststroke motion. The Japanese soldiers didn't know what to make of these strange intruders. The island's residents, however, knew of the creatures, which they called orangakan, or man-fish. They had lived alongside these beings for generations, sometimes catching them in their own fishing nets. One encounter heaped ridicule upon a Japanese sergeant for decades afterward. An islander summoned surveillance officer Taro Horiba to a nearby village in the middle of the night. Apparently, he had a discovery to share. An orangutan that had washed up on the beach earlier that day. When Horiba reached the home of the chieftain, he found the creature's deceased body exactly as promised. According to Horiba... The being was around five feet tall with webbing between its long fingers and toes. Some types of algae covered its skin. The face, a hideous amalgamation of an ape and a fish, was topped with reddish brown hair and is in the soldier's description, spines along the neck. Its nose seemed vestigial, the forehead broad, the ears small within the fish-like mouth sat rows of spiny, sharp teeth. Despite having seen the beings before at a distance, Reaper was dumbfounded. He was so shocked, in fact, that he failed to collect any evidence. He didn't even take any pictures. For years afterwards, he implored scientists to investigate the islands, but his pleas fell on deaf ears. Merfolk represent an important part of belief in an island in Southeast Asia. In Java, Nairoro Kidal is a sea goddess who can take the form of a mermaid. In the Philippines, merfolk are called Serena, although exactly what they are varies between cultures. Some believe they are divine, while others adopt a more practical stance. For example, in 1978, Filipino fisherman Hacin Tofedalvero was encouraged to share the secret of his success. He eventually confessed that he had made a pact with a mermaid with amiable blue eyes, reddish cheeks, and green scales on her tail. He refused to elaborate further. With so many sightings, why are photographs of merfolk so hard to come by? The simplest answer is that they don't exist, but images captured off the shore of Hawaiian islands of Kauai suggest otherwise. After decades of hearing rumors, dive master Jeff Leischer secured what he believes is proof of the Kauai mermaid. On April 12, 1998, Jeff was taking a team of six other divers out to sea when a pod of dolphins began following their boat. He shared what happened next with reporters, saying, Suddenly, one of the men on the port side starts yelling and pointing. I couldn't believe what I saw. There, not 10 feet from the bow, was what looked like a nude woman. She had long, flowing hair and one of the most beautiful faces I've ever seen. But there's no way a human being could be swimming so fast. She was keeping right up with the dolphins. Then she leapt into the air, and my heart almost gave out on me. The entire lower half of her was covered with scales and tapered back into a huge fish tail. She jumped once more and then disappeared forever under the surface. In addition to Jeff and the divers, three other passengers claimed to witness this same event. An hour later, they were in the middle of their dive when something brushed Jeff's leg. He looked up and saw the mermaid again, this time from below. And Jeff said, she shot by me like a streak of lightning, then turned and came back past me, swimming the other way. I just aimed the camera and began snapping pictures. I kept shooting as she broke for the surface and swam away. It all sounds suspiciously like a promotional stunt for Jeff's dive company. The photos were supposedly analyzed and seem legitimate, but mermaid photos are easy to fabricate, meaning they are equally hard to disprove. And there seem to be plenty of hoaxes. One just surfaced this spring from South Africa. 
showing what is either a merboy or a child stuffed into a fish. Either way, the whole thing is pretty fishy. One of the most infamous mermaid hoaxes took place in June of 1967. Dozens of passengers riding a ferry near Maine Island, British Columbia, clearly observed a mermaid sitting on the tip of Helen Point. Many began snapping photographs, and witnesses said they saw her intermittently eating a salmon and singing a sorrowful song. In 2016, a journalist tracked down the mermaid. Her name is Judy Allred. She now works in Realty in Idaho. She and some accomplices staged the event on a whim just for the halibut to promote a local fishing derby. While the fish was indeed missing a chunk, she never ate it, and her sorrowful song was actually Judy calling for help. The costume was getting caught in the wake of the ferry, which threatened to drag her under. But just because proof of merfolk has eluded us doesn't mean some folks aren't trying their best to obtain it. The mayor of Kirat Yam in Israel, compelled by numerous sightings, offered $1 million in USD in 2010 to anyone who could provide indisputable proof of the local mermaid's existence. Some of these sightings from the beach, which occur most often at sunset, are quite compelling. Supposedly, the mermaid puts in quite the show, dancing and leaping above the water like a dolphin. Stories began flooding in around late 2009 after a new promenade afforded tourists greater access to the seashore. One of the first witnesses, Shlomo Cohen, said that he was hanging out with a friend when all of a sudden they noticed a woman lying in the sand in a peculiar position. The possibility of another sunbather was dispelled when they approached her and she dove into the water tail and all. Sometimes, an eerie calm accompanies the encounters, as one older gentleman said after wading into the surf. I was looking like this, looking back and forth. What's around? The sea. Quiet, but inside I wasn't quiet. As if something was around me. But I don't know what. Almost no waves, peaceful. Above, stars. And suddenly, someone spread my legs with their hands. Intentionally, I stood like this, and it passed through. If she flirted with me like this, I think she wants to meet me again. That's what I think. She didn't touch everyone with her hands like this. You know what it feels like when she pushes your legs like that? A feeling like from heaven. I take it back. Maybe being drunk and horny can make you see mermaids after all. Construction on a pair of reservoirs in Zimbabwe came to a grinding halt in early 2012. While deemed essential to the country's water supply, workers simply refuse to continue. They claim that these sites right near Gakwe and Mutare were plagued by dangerous merfolk. All the officers I have sent have vowed not to go back there, a water resources minister, Saipepa Nkomo, told reporters. We even hired whites thinking that our boys did not want to work, but they also returned saying they would not return to work there again. According to stories shared among builders, the merfolk had harassed them as they installed water pumps. The creatures also caused equipment to malfunction in mysterious ways. In one instance, divers sent to investigate blockages in the pumps had resurfaced with looks of terror on their faces, vowing to never submerge again. Belief in merfolk and similar water spirits enjoys a long history in this part of Africa, where they are often blamed for drownings, disappearances, mysterious deaths, and yes, torture. In 2000, two men drowned at a dam in Mandoro, South Africa. The pair had allegedly died while pursuing a mermaid. The area around this dam has seen plenty of strange activity over the years. Yet, the mermaid is a relatively new arrival. According to the wife of a village elder, the mermaid had been dropped there by a whirlwind shortly after the dam's construction. The woman had seen the wind hover above the lake and then heard the sound of a large boulder hitting the water, the mermaid, released into her new home. Ever since then, the water inexplicably became muddy, even when the lake is calm and no one is swimming. Dogs, which South African mermaids allegedly hate, are pulled underwater regularly. 
on top of all of this, drownings have now skyrocketed. Since then, mermaids in Zimbabwe have been accused of further death and dismemberment, including the theft of a woman's teeth in 2016. In 2019, Clarice Chuma, age 34, claimed that a mysterious whirlwind had dragged her underwater. She found herself in a submerged lair where a trio of merfolk held her captive for two to three weeks. Claris had been bathing and chasing fish with her sister in the Zimbabwe River when the abduction had occurred. After her disappearance, Claris's family remained skeptical about the whole mermaid narrative, but began growing more concerned with each passing day. In desperation, they asked members of their church for help, but the price was simply too steep. They demanded a pair of cows. In the meantime, Clarice suffered each passing day. If her story is to be believed, she was only offered raw fish to eat. Her half-human, half-fish captors threatened to kill her should she disobey. At last, Clarice's family enlisted the aid of Medzibaba Edborn, an itinerant preacher and church planter who offered his services for free. According to reports, the prophet, church members, and the family prayed at the river, after prayers, the water was dark and cycling. The prophet instructed the family to look in the water and saw Clarice lying in the cave under the water. Her body successfully recovered, the preacher began to spit on Clarice while her family sang hymns of praise. When she had regained consciousness, she had a miraculous tale to tell. She described how it all ended. The mermaids told me that I had to return home as some people were looking for me. They handed me a basket and an arrow with a lot of medicines and instructed me to heal people in return with gifts of money at the cave as thanksgiving. I was shocked to see people gathered around with my family present and my body was so powerless. The prophet then burnt the basket to ashes and I don't know how to thank him for saving me. Claire's Chuma's story bears a strong resemblance to that of a traditional healer, Justice Mayonga. In 2012, he claimed that he had learned his craft from a two-year-old sojourn among the mermaids. When he asked to elaborate, he said this, A mermaid is a very mysterious creature. You can't really say what complexion it is, what color it is. It can be like a white person or an Arab. But one distinguishing feature is that they have long hair. Very, very long hair. It is meters long. And once they take you there, you live like them. You wear something that does not show your feet. You eat what they eat. You eat fish, rice, and chicken only. On the first day, you are taken into the water. You are given millet or sorghum meal and two silver fish. The fish will be rotten, but you are told to eat them. If you show any sign of disgust, the mermaids won't be happy with your ancestors and you could be killed. Apparently, Justice played his cards right. You could say the mermaids gave him a new porpoise in life. Like Claris, Justice joined the ranks of traditional healers in the region, healers like those who alleviated the reservoir problems in 2012. At their wit's end, the Zimbabwe government finally hired local magicians to conduct rituals appeasing the merfolk at the reservoirs. These actions consisted of brewing beer and slaughtering cattle in their honor. Minister Nakomo justified this action by saying, I do not believe in mermaids, but the community that lives in the area does. If the reports are to be believed, merfolk continue to harass residents in Zimbabwe even today. Most recently, in July of 2021, five people performing exorcism rituals jumped into a pool of mash fingo. Three never resurfaced. A fourth man, by the name of Amos Chituri, claimed that they had visited the riverside in an effort to expel a spirit from one of the village's children. A total of around nine people watched as the five men jumped in, accompanied by an ominous rumbling from the hills. According to Amos, they had not jumped into the water, but rather been pushed over the edge by an unseen force. He and the father of the child then waded ashore, unsure of exactly what had occurred. It was only after a head count that they realized several members of their party were missing. Since one of the victims had been kidnapped by a merfolk in the past, it was assumed they were to blame. The river did not keep its debt, however. 
Authorities eventually recover the bodies of the others. And for centuries, scientists and mythologists alike have attempted to rationalize the mermaid archetype. Are merfolk simply figments of our imagination, or are they somehow based in this reality? As discussed earlier, the most popular explanation for merfolk argues that the earliest sightings were inspired by misidentifications of aquatic mammals. Cryptozoologists, more open-minded than a majority of the scientific community, have proposed a number of novel solutions, up to and including the idea that merfolk actually represent an undiscovered species living alongside human beings in the Earth's oceans. These ideas run the gamut of plausibility. Some are quite believable, like the idea that merfolk represent an uncatalogued manatee or seal species. But stranger ideas are equally popular. Around the year 2000, a collective of Fordian researchers and cryptozoologists led by Lorne Coleman, Jerome Clark, Mark Hall, among many others, attempted to thoroughly categorize mer beings. They proposed that merfolk sightings can be roughly divided into two subsets. A benevolent, seafaring race bearing fin-like appendages and more aggressive amphibious freshwater variety that leaves behind webbed footprints whenever it ventures on land. The latter category may be related to the Latin American phenomenon of El Chupacabras, and is broad enough to encompass creatures not normally deemed to be merfolk, beasts like the Honey Island Swamp Monster of the Lizard Man of Bishopville, South Carolina. This line of speculation hypothesizes that Certain primates have adapted to a more aquatic lifestyle. While far-fetched to us today, some indications in the historical records suggest that the idea might be possible. Did a German zoologist actually spot a mermaid off the coast of Alaska in the early 18th century? For 10 years, beginning in 1733, a George Steller served as a naturalist for the Great Northern Expedition, one of history's largest exploratory endeavors. While other members of the crew mapped the Arctic coastline, Steller was charged with recording new animal species. He succeeded in this regard, and his name lent to several novel species, including a jay and eider, a sea eagle and a sea lion. But George Steller may have discovered something even more astounding. Around sunset, on August 10, 1741, Steller was surveying the ocean right near Alaska's own Shumigan Islands when he spotted something bobbing in the waves. And for over two hours, he and a strange creature watched one another with mutual fascination. The animal coming so close that one of the poles on board could have touched it. In his description, he wrote this. It was about two Russian eels in length, i.e. about five feet long, the head was like a dog's, with pointed erect ears. From the upper and lower lips on both sides, whiskers hung down. The eyes were large, the body was long, rather thick and round, tapering gradually towards the tail. The skin seemed thickly covered with hair of a gray color on the back, but reddish-white on the belly. In the water, however, the whole animal appeared red like a cow. The tail was divided into two fins of which the upper was twice as large as the lower. Nothing struck me as more surprising than the fact that neither forefeet nor, in their steed, fins were to be seen. As Stellar and the crew watched, the creature would actually rise above the water in a human-like posture, then dive to the opposite side of the ship, an action it repeated some 30 times. At one point, it grabbed a clump of seaweed with its mouth, then juggled it like a train monkey might in a circus. Eventually, being a naturalist, Steller took a shot at the animal but missed. It disappeared underwater before returning, visibly afraid. After the creature reacclimated to the sailors, Steller took another shot, missed or wounded the creature, and lost it forever beneath the waves. The mystery of Steller's sea ape endures in cryptozoological circles to this day. Now, over the years, numerous proposals have suggested that Steller misidentified a seal, or Cyrenian, or even a snake. Some naturalists took Steller at his word and tried assigning his sea ape a variety of scientific names. 
Others believe that the entire affair was a prank aimed at the Danish leader of the Great Northern Expedition, Vitus Bering, with whom Stella regularly found himself in disagreement. The creature's whiskered face bears a resemblance to Bering's facial hair. There may even be a clue when one of the names assigned to the creature, Simnia Marina Danica, Danish sea ape. Bering was the only Danish crew member, and many of the dismissals of Stellar's sea ape would just don't hold up. Would the person who first recorded a new sea lion species really misidentify another animal to this degree? Why would Stellar risk his credibility on a prank? He did, after all, have a stellar reputation. What's more, a second sighting of an identical animal took place in June of 1965, reported by sailor Miles Smeaton and two others off Atka Island's northern coast. The creature was an exact match for Stellar's sea ape right down to its face, which was compared to a dog's, a shih tzu to be exact. One final possibility worth exploring is our own link as Homo sapiens to mermaid mythology. The aquatic ape hypothesis, a highly controversial idea which arose in the 60s, argues that competition over terrestrial foraging had somehow forced a subset of our ancestors to take to the shoreline in their search for food. Doing so, this group acquired many adaptations better suited for use in the water than on land. Proponents of the aquatic ape hypothesis cite several compelling aspects of human anatomy. Our relatively hairless skin is a poor adaptation to life on land, but can be seen in semi-aquatic mammals like the hippopotamus. Our larynx sits in our throats rather than in our noses, as in aquatic animals who close off their trachea when diving. Some animals comparable to us in intelligence and relative brain size are cetaceans, like dolphins or cephalopods, like the octopus, aquatic species. Our hooded noses also seem well adapted to keep out splashing water. No other primate enjoys swimming as much as we do. Human infants can swim or learn to swim before they can walk. Only when we second guess ourselves later in life do we start losing this natural talent. Vernix cassiosa, a biofilm covering newborns, is primary seen in the pups of aquatic animals. Only apes in captivity develop the layer of fat that human beings possess. But we, like aquatic species, come by it naturally. We even undergo bizarre physiological changes when underwater. This is readily observed in the free divers of Malaysia and Indonesia, the Bajau. These individuals are able to stay 200 feet underwater at crushing pressure for nearly 15 minutes. This is in part due to the mammalian dive reflex, a staple of aquatic creatures like otters and dolphins and humans. Our bodies automatically lower our heart rate, slow our metabolism, and divert blood pressure from our extremities to our vital organs. Pressure on the spleen releases extra hemoglobin, making oxygen transportation more efficient. After enough free driving, our eyes even adjust to see better underwater. All these factors might suggest we were designed to be amphibious, or a close relative could be. Multiple possibilities arise when considering the aquatic ape hypothesis. Are these adaptations new or simply holdovers from any lineage that decided to stay in the ocean where they remain today in the form of merfolk? Or did these subset of humans with aquatic tendencies push their abilities further and further until they disappeared into the sea? Why do we all share these minor aquatic adaptations? Did these shoreline humans interbreed with the terrestrial humans and these traits simply remained? In any case, the degree to which human beings are uniquely adapted to a semi-aquatic lifestyle is worth considering. Even if mermaids aren't exactly real, they are inescapable. The image of the siren is arguably as prevalent as religious iconography, perhaps even more so. Every corner has a Starbucks, and mermaids permeate our media landscape in the form of films, television programs, and fantasy novels. Wherever you turn, the siren awaits, and her call beckons to us all. But more importantly, what do you guys think? Are mermaids real? Are they simply just a fictitious tale that has been ongoing since the early days of man? You let me know what you think in the comments below. 
As always, guys, if you're new to the channel, be sure to go ahead and smack that big ol' red subscribe button, and be sure to like this video as well if you want to see more content like this. Just remember to keep an open mind. I love you all, and I will see you guys in the very next episode.